How's, uh, how's y'all week been? Y'all from the South? Y'all. So, everybody had a good week? Anybody have a bad week? Anybody have a bad week? It's okay. We have bad weeks. You know, it's okay as a Christian to confess when we've had a bad week. I think there's this idea in Christianity that we have to ask, like, everything's great. Um, that's not in Scripture. We actually see David in the book of Psalms. how He's very honest and real about what, what we would describe today as depression, anxiety. Did you know that? Um, Jesus in the garden. Remember in the garden how he said, man, I can't wait. This is exciting. Come crucify me. Do you remember reading that? No, he didn't say that, did he? And so it's okay to say, hey, man, I've had a good week. Um, but sometimes we have bad days and we have bad weeks, and it's okay to admit that. This is a place where we can come and be safe and real. Um, I don't know how your week has been, but I know this. It's good to see you. Now, before I get into the message, uh, anybody ever watch Oprah Winfrey back in the day? And she uh, always had her, I think it was a yearly thing where she would give stuff away. You know, and she would like, look at this new TV, and you get a TV, and you get a TV. I, I don't have a TV for you, but um, I do have something for you. So we got the carnival coming up. And we're excited because it's a way that we're going to roll out our fall programs. People are going to come here, get the registration cards, let them know about what we are doing, what we have for kids' ministry. So we're excited about that. And uh, as we do that, we want that day to be a success. Because every connection that we make is one more person we can invite to come out to our uh, fall ministries, to our small groups. And the key to making that day a success, obviously prayer, you name it, etc. But who's responsible to make that day a great day? All of you guys are. Okay, um, and here's how you can play a role in that. One, we talked about it. We still need some donations, although we've had a lot of donations. Thank you for all those that have donated. Uh, we need help with some of the uh, things that we're going to be doing. But the other thing that you can do, pray and invite people. And there's a lot of ways that you can do that. Personal invite, Facebook, share the thing, or the thing that I have for you. And this is my Oprah Winfrey for you today. Y'all get a slip when you leave here today. And I'd love for you to take a bunch of these home. And if you see some people that have kids, neighbors, etc., pass it out. So I'm going to do that. Uh, you get a slip and you get a slip. We'll start with Ryan. He can't wait. He loves talking to people. Um, he's so sociable. He can't wait. But um, anyways, if you guys could pass these around, grab a few. Grab five or six and pass them out to neighbor kids. Um, let's get this night to be a wonderful night. Uh, last night was a good night here. It was great. Um, you know, we're in August. Of course, the weather's nice. People are traveling on vacation. You don't know what you're going to get. But we had a good night last night. In fact, uh, we had around 30 kids in the back. Isn't that wonderful? Um, isn't that amazing? Praise God. And, of course, we continue to make changes to the building. You saw that we put in the sound booth. You all notice we took down the door in that, uh, that pole there, by the way. If you turn around and take a look back there, that pole is no longer there. Um, so it opens things up. And Dan did a lot of work, so let's all thank Dan. Um, even though Dan doesn't like that, he hates this. He's looking away. Dad, come on now. Just say, there you go. He's all red in the face. But anyways, uh, a lot of guys worked hard to get the facility, I think, uh, more user-friendly for church service. And I love what God is doing. Um, one more thing I'm looking for. Two weeks from now, we're getting a series. Um, I've been here 10 years, and this is the second time that I'm going to preach on money. We'll do six-week series. I don't like to preach on money for a lot of reasons. One, I hate the label that, you know, Christians get. You know, pastors are always about money, right? So we can drive our sports cars and, and dress really fancy. Okay. And, uh, and, but yet, that's the preconceived idea, so I hate talking about money. But we are going to talk about money um, for the second time in my 10 years here. Um, and here's why. It's not about money. I don't care. If you know me, I'm not materialistic. I don't care about nice things, nice clothes. I'm not like that. But what I do believe, though, is that to do the work of the ministry, to reach people, to be missional, it requires resources, doesn't it? You know, when we talk about wanting to reach more people, we talked about moving this building to a better location. We talk about eventually being able to hire staff, how neat that would be, that could do outreach and better programs for us. And that requires resources, so we're going to do that. But we're going to have one night that's going to be a testimony night. Because I think part of giving requires faith, doesn't it? I don't know about you, but when God first started us back, when we were like in our 20s and we got saved, and God said, you need to start giving. And, you know, giving away part of your paycheck. And our first thought is, I can barely put food on the table now. I can't give away any of my check. You, all, you ever been there with tithing? God saying, hey, have faith. Just trust me in this. We're like, nah, I don't know about that. Um, but we did, and God was so faithful. But it does require faith. But here's the thing that we're going to do. One night during the six-week series, we're going to do a testimony night. Because here's what I know. It requires faith, and often when we share stories of God's provision, it causes faith to rise up in us, doesn't it? To remind you, you know what, God is a good God, He's a faithful God, He will provide. And if we begin to step out in faith as a church and individually, God's not going to forget. He's not going to let you down. So if you're interested in sharing a testimony that night specifically about how God has blessed you at times when you've stepped out, maybe in tithing or financially, um, let me know and we're going to work you into that service. And uh, I think that's it for now. Let's, uh, let's pray and get into today's message. Father, we thank you for your mercy and grace. Father, we thank you for your word. 
Lord, as we begin to look at the last words of John today, I pray that we would self-examine. And Father, I believe that every single one of us, if we were honest here today, there's probably areas of our life that you want us to work on. And Lord, we are great at justifying those areas and holding on to them and feeling like we're fine. But Lord, I would pray that by your spirit, by your grace, in a loving way that only you can do, that you begin to unreally peel back layers in our life of things that need to be changed, issues that need to be addressed, things that if we're not careful can become idols. Father, I certainly can't be the Holy Spirit for somebody else. I struggle with my own heart. But Father, I pray that your spirit would be sufficient right now to speak to us, remove distractions, and when we leave here, help us to change the way that we live our lives for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that when you leave here today, there'll be one area. If you are open today, if your heart and mind is open, I believe that there's one area today, at least one, where God will highlight an area that maybe you need to work on. I believe that with all my heart. And if you don't leave here today with one area that God maybe poked at you, an area where he feels like you need to work on something that it could become an idol, I think it's because you're not listening. I, I tell you what, as I looked through this this week, there's areas in my life where I thought, hey, I need to, uh, to address that. When I got saved, I had some idols. Anybody have idols in their life when you first got saved? I know I did. Um, and there were things that weren't necessarily on the surface bad. One area for idol was to me it was sports. And another one, now listen to this, you know another idol for me was my wife. You know people can be an idol. So we're going to get into that today. Um, so I hope that you're listening. Now I want to get into the last thing that John says here. 1 John 5, 21, he says, Little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. So that's John's mic drop right there. Boom, he's done. He said, hey, you know what? Keep yourself from idols. Amen. That's the last verse that John had spoke. Now, I want to break this down a little bit and talk about these things. Now, first thing I want to address is how he calls them little children. And when he does that, that, it reveals four things about his relationship with them and who they are. The four things that it reveals when he calls them little children are, one, it shows John's love for them, the parental responsibility that he felt towards them. It shows their identity and their maturity. There's four things that that reveals. I think it's important to know that John had a deep love for them like a parent. What would you do for your kids? If your kid was in trouble and in danger, would you risk your life for your child? Have, have you ever stayed up late and lost sleep for your child? Yes, you have. If you had babies, we all have, right? Um, you've changed dirty diapers. You've probably helped financially. You've seen them make mistakes. You've probably wept with your child. Like You've done an awful lot for your child because they're precious to you. And so for John, he really had this attitude towards them like they were his children, And he was a parent to them. But it wasn't just him. The apostles were that way. See, they didn't just run churches. They felt a deep responsibility for the well-being of their soul. Listen to what Paul said here. Because Paul and John have a very similar attitude towards the church. Here's what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians. He said, we were gentle among you as a nursing mother cherishes her own child. He's like, you know, think about a nursing mother. I don't know about you, but the first time that we had a baby, I was afraid to hold it. Because it was just so delicate. I felt like it had a self-destruct button, you know. And then you hear that these soft spots on their head. And, like, it was just scary. Do you remember that? You know, I'm like, Brenda's like, you want to hold your baby? And I'm like, I don't know about that. Uh, maybe you should just stick to that and I'll stick to my thing. Um, because it's so precious and delicate. That's what John said here. Like, you know what? We were like that with you. As a nursing mother cherishes her own child, we were affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased not only to impart the gospel, but our own lives because you were precious to us. So when John writes this and he calls them little children, he comes from a place of parental love. And what that tells me is that his last words are done with care, concern. They're done with good motives. They're not said flippantly. Like, it means a lot. He calls them little children. That reveals their identity. Back in chapter 3 when John wrote, he talked about the children of the devil and the children of God. So when he calls them little children there, he's specifically saying, hey, your identity is your royalty. You belong to God. You're not just like anybody. You're a child of God. The child of the one true king. Last night, uh, anybody uh, know the song, um, Hello, My Name Is by Mercy Me? Okay, I I love that song. I really do. Now, I'm here at church, and it was one of those weeks where, you know, I have ups and downs. You know me, I'm an emotional guy. I have high highs, lows, lows. I, I, I feel big. And, uh, you know, I've been fighting uh, a summer cold, go figure. Um, And uh, there's just some other things I was wrestling with. I'm also the guy that, even though church can be going great, I'll think about the family that hasn't been here in a month or two, or someone who's struggling in their life, or guys we know we're doing a funeral next week. And that'll weigh heavy on my heart. And then you begin to listen to lies of the enemy. 
You know, you're not sufficient. You're not good enough. The church is going to close its doors. Here's what's happening in America today. Oh, no, the sky is falling. But I put on that sod last night before church. I got here about two hours before everybody, and I just worship. I cranked it up really loud. And, you know, and I love what he said. It basically said, stop listening to the enemies. You're a child of the one true Cain. Isn't that amazing? That's who you are. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? Here's all I can tell. Do you live like you're that? Because that'll tell you if you think you're really a child of God. Do you live like a child of God? So he's calling them that. The other thing he says here by calling them little children, he conveys that they're, they're youth. By calling them little children, he shows their need to continue to grow and mature. And the one thing I would take away from that for us is that, first of all, I don't care how mature you have been. I don't care how long you walk with God. You are not fully mature. Can I get an amen on that one? And that's including myself. Like, you know when you stop maturing? When you stop growing? When you die. That's it. And so what he's saying there is by a little child, he's saying, hey, you know what? You're my little child. You're not a baby anymore, but you still need to continue to mature. We want to make sure that we're not like those in 1 Corinthians where Paul addressed. Now listen to what he said to the church. We don't want to be this way. He said, I cannot speak to a spiritual people, but as carnal people, as babies in Christ. He's saying, you know what? You're kind of behaving like a baby. And we don't want to do that. We want to continue to grow and mature in our faith. Now let's get to what John said here. He said, little children, keep yourself from idols. These are his last words. Now remember, communication was harder back in the day. It wasn't like today. You couldn't just get on Facebook and send out a message. In fact, I had something. I, I sent Jesse a message. Like, literally a second before I came up here, I grabbed my phone. I sent Jesse a message. Uh, Facebook is that easy. We have no modern day. They didn't have a modern day postal system back then to put a stamp on an envelope. You can't drive there in your Kia. You can't text or call. So back then when you wrote a letter, your last words could literally be your last words to those people forever. That could be it. And these are the last words of John. So I started thinking about, you know, your last words. Or like, you're, you're, what, what if you're on your deathbed? I know it sounds morbid, but hear me for a second. If you're on your deathbed, what would your last words be to somebody that you love? Thank God you have life insurance. Thank God you have life insurance. There's, there we go. I want to pray about those last words. But that's good. So, um, so last night I brought my daughter Gabby up here, my youngest one. She's 19. And I brought her up here to kind of illustrate a point. And to emphasize the point, so I brought Gabby up here, and, and I was kind of acting this idea like, here's my baby, I'm on my deathbed, and what would I say to her as my last words? See, there's a lot of things that John could say to them. He could say, you know what, I hope to see you soon. I miss you, I love you. Uh, seek Jesus. That would have been a good one, right? Keep your eyes on the Lord. He could have said, I'm proud of you. You know, so I had, I had Gabby up here, and I could have said, you know, uh, you always be my baby. You know, I, I'm proud of the woman that you become. Uh, I love you. You know, keep God at the center of your life. Like, these would be a lot of things that would be appropriate. You know, give your dad a hug. Okay? Like, would that be some good last words? Probably. But instead, can you imagine if I looked at Gabby, I'm about to die, and the only thing I say is, stay away from idols. Ugh. And that was it. But that's what John says. He finishes the letter by saying, hey, stay away from idols. Yes. So do you think that that's important to him? You think it's important to John? Yeah. yeah, it is. There's a reason why he said that. It meant a lot to him. He loved these people. So if he said, stay away from my idols, then that's obviously a major issue. Is it any different today? Should we guard our heart from idols? Yes, we should. These are John's last words, so it must be vitally important. Now, what John said there specifically, he didn't say stay away from idols. He actually said, keep yourself from idols. Well, what does it mean to keep yourself? Does he mean avoid idols at all costs? That if there's an idol, have nothing to do with it. Well, if that's what he means, that's a problem. Do you know why that's an issue? Because there's idols everywhere. Because in the same letter, John had said, in fact, in the same chapter, he said that the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. Which means that everywhere you go, there's idols. You go to a gas station, there's probably idols. Your friends, your family, your neighbor, your coworker. You go to Walmart, there's idols everywhere. You can't avoid that. It would be impossible to just stay away from every single idol. In fact, we know that's not what he intended because in 1 Corinthians, Paul said this, when I wrote you in my epistle not to keep company of sexually immoral people, he said, I wasn't referring to people of the world. Okay? He said, I didn't mean sexually immoral people of this world or idolaters because you need to what? Go out of the world. He said, you can't get away from it. They're everywhere. 
And by the way, was that Jesus' will? Did Jesus do that? Did he just stay away from every single person that was in idolatry? He did not. In fact, he did the opposite. He went to where sinners were. He ate with sinners. He penetrated the dark places to make a difference and to change things for the glory of God. Amen? So he didn't isolate. We know that's not God's will for us because Jesus' prayer to the Father said this. I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So if he means to avoid idols at all costs, here's what we'd have to do. We'd have to become monks and live in a monastery. But Jesus didn't do that, did he? Did the apostles do that? No. And here's the thing. Even if you did that, let's say you bought some land in the middle of nowhere and you got away from all the evil of the world and you had no electronics, no nothing, this and that, and you were living like a monk, idols can creep into the most isolated places. Did you know that? Because the real problem with idolatry, it's a heart issue. And you can't run away from your own heart as much as we would like to. God doesn't want us to hide or leave the world. You know what he wants us to do? To be a light that changes the world. He wants us to go and to redeem back the places that the enemy has got strongholds. To redeem back these things for the glory of God. That's what he wants you to do. Do you know that? When you go to work, you're on mission. When you go to the gas station, you're on mission. Everything that you do, by the way, is an opportunity by God's grace to be on mission. Do you believe that? Because that's the truth of it. Everything's a mission for us. So what it means to keep yourself from idols, it simply means don't let it influence you. Now, this is where it gets tricky. He said, hey, don't let idols influence your life. Here's where it's hard. We are really good at justifying ourselves, aren't we? That's not an idol. That doesn't control me. I could walk away from that any time. And I think sometimes we lack honesty. So that's where it gets difficult. And what I'm hoping to do today for all of us is that we go back this week and we really come before God with honesty and say, Lord, do I have an idol in my life? Or something that could become an idol? And here's the other thing. Maybe you don't have any idols right now, but I know about me. I've gotten rid of idols in my life and been good, and then later on in life they've crept back in. So it's not like you're good now. It has to be a continued process of always being aware of these things in your heart. Now when we think of idolatry... The Bible talks about 158 times and every time it warns against idolatry. And we think about obvious idols. I think about like worshiping a statue like the golden calf or the mother Mary or Buddha. Like we think of idols like that, right? Statue that we create and we bow down and we worship it and we put flowers on it and we kiss it. Okay, so that's obvious. But we know that we're not supposed to do that. In fact, the Bible speaks that with a lot of clarity. Okay? When it says this in Exodus, don't make for yourself a carved image, that's a statue, or any likeness of anything on heaven or on earth. Don't bow down to them or serve them, for I'm the Lord your God is a jealous God. They said, don't do that. Don't bow down to a statue. Don't worship it. By the way, you know that your God is jealous for you? It's funny that you chose that song because you had no idea, but I love what it says there, that your God is jealous for you. Now, there's an unhealthy jealousy, but there's also what we call a healthy jealousy. Okay? And here's what a healthy jealousy is. Okay? And by the way, how is married life treating you too? Good? Okay, we're going to say the whole church is watching you here. So how is it? Uh, I don't know. It's, I don't know. So you're married. That's wonderful, right? Happily married in the honeymoon stage, you know? And so, uh, but let's just pretend that... Um, Noah starts having a coworker. This would never happen, so you don't have to get paranoid because he's a good guy. But uh, let's say Noah starts developing a relationship with another girl there at uh, you know work, and she's beautiful and attractive, and they start spending their lunches together, and they start messaging her on Facebook, and they start talking to each other. You know, would that bother you, Emma? And it better because if it didn't bother you, I think you're not right in the head. Okay, like that's a healthy jealousy because you are betrothed to one another. And that's what God is saying to us is, hey, I love you and I want to be your heart's desire. Our God is a jealous God, so don't bow down to statues. And why would we want to do that, by the way? Why would we want to worship any saint, athlete, musician, actor, much less a statue? They will always disappoint you and they are not God. In fact, in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius meets Peter. He sees Peter. You know what he does when he sees Peter? He falls down at his feet to worship Peter because Peter did some pretty amazing things, right? He did some miracles. And what did Peter say? Get on your feet and do not worship me because I'm a man just like you. 
So we shouldn't worship anybody besides God. But I'm not going to get down to, to what I would call obvious idols. And idolatry is more than worshiping a statue. In fact, if you really want to know what idolatry is, at its core, it's, it's worship. And you can worship things without bowing down to them. Did you know that? So I want to get to what the core, really, of idolatry and worshiping of things is. Ezekiel said this. I'm going to get to the next slide there for me. Thank you. Ezekiel 14.3 says this. Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts. Idolatry is really a hard issue for you. That's really what will determine it. In fact, Colossians 3 says, as put to death, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covenants, which is idolatry. So idolatry is so much more than a statue and things like that. It's really deep inside of our heart. Idolatry really boils down to our heart and what's in there. So I want to take a deeper look at the definition of idols, and I will look at some application for us, some modern-day application so that we can go home and hopefully grow in our faith. The word idol, here's what it means, that word idol. It means a representation, a symbol of an object of worship, a false god, the likeness of something obsolete, a false concept. We'll get back to false concept in a bit. But really what it comes down to is, is whatever you worship. Now, now here's the key. Now listen to this. This is the definition of worship. Besides God, it can mean excessive admiration or devotion to a person or thing, to feel passion, devotion, tenderness for, love, and to admire something too much. That's pretty broad, isn't it? When you think about it in terms like that, if that can be idolatry is what you worship, to admire, to have too much devotion, too much dedication, to love something or admire something too much, that's pretty broad, isn't it? Another thing in Exodus, it says this, that we're not to make a carved image, right? That we're not to bow down to it or to serve it. Another way that you can tell if something's an idol in your life is, are you serving that thing? Simply put, here's what I would say. Here's what idolatry is. Excessive and disproportionate love, care, devotion to something or someone. An idol is anything that takes away your devotion to God from serving God because you can't serve two masters, can you? What does it say? You will love one, you'll hate the other. You'll be loyal to one, you'll despise the other. You cannot have two masters in your life. Idols are a lot broader. Here's how you can measure idols. I want to say this very clearly. Okay? Look at what occupies your thought life, what uses up your time, what affects your emotions, and what you invest in. What do you invest in your time, your money, and your emotions? And be honest with yourself. That's how you can tell. What occupies your thoughts, what uses up your time, and what affects your emotions. When I say affects your emotions, consider this. I've had people say things like, that's not an idol in my life. And maybe it is, maybe it is. I don't know. If you can walk away from it for a month, let's say, and say, you know what, I don't need to do that for a month, then you're probably fine. But if the very idea makes you anxious or you get angry or you want to defend yourself, it's probably a good indication that's an idol for you. And I know that because I've had things in my life that way. I have a hard time walking away. It says where your treasure is so your heart will be also. What you treasure, what you invest in, shows where your heart's at. So I'm going to look at a few things today that are not obvious idols because I know what the obvious idol is. I'm not going to talk down to you. But I think they're less obvious now, when I talk about less obvious idols, I could do an entire series on this and still miss something because there's so many out there. But what I'm hoping that you get the principle and you self-examine, and this will begin to spark your thinking in your life. So I want to talk about less obvious idols. First, I want to talk about things like things that you own. Okay? It could be a car. It could be a house. It could be a property. Now, I want to say this. Owning things is not wrong. I'm not saying that you can't own things. But there are people, for example, and I've seen people this way, like they'll have a car and they adore this thing. They'll pour tons of time and energy to keep it clean. There's a guy that I used to have a car. He, he wanted it perfect. And if he walked over to look at his nice car, he'd stop you when you got close and said, hey, don't touch the car. I'm here to tell you, like, that's, that's a little bit over top, isn't it? 
They'll pour a lot of energy. They'll, they'll name their car like it's one of their kids. You know? It can happen with your house, a motorcycle, snowmobile, a boat, you name it. Now, am I saying that's wrong to own these things and take care of them? No, not at all. In fact, you know, it's okay to own things and you should steward them well. But make sure, okay, that the things that you own don't own you. Let me say that again. Make sure the things that you own don't own you. See, if we really look at it properly, you don't actually own anything in this life anyways. Did you know that? As a believer, you're just a steward of God's things. So the boat that you have, who actually owns that boat? The Lord does. Your car, God does. Your snowmobile, God does. And he's given you graciously as a gift. Praise him for that, and that's okay. But that same God that can give you, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. He might say to you now, like, hey, I want to bless you with this brand new boat or this motorcycle or whatever it is. It's a gift I want to give you. But then two years later, God might say, no, I want you to sell that. We take everything that we own with an open hand. That's how you can tell. I was watching a thing about the 80s. Remember Cabbage Patch Kids? Anybody own one? Anybody? One did. Last night, there was more hands raised. This must be an older crowd. Or... But... Uh, it was crazy. They had a hard time producing it quick enough, and they showed it's, it's, it really happened. People would line up to get Cabbage Patch Kids and get into fights over these things. Adults fighting over Cabbage Patch Kids. Isn't that sad? Or consider this about things that we purchase. And by the way, I think you get what you pay for. In life, sometimes it's wise to buy the nicer name brand because you get better quality. But there are some things out there that are actually produced, did you know, by the same manufacturer, the exact same thing, the exact same ingredients, made the exact same way, but one, they'll slap a generic label on it, and the other one, they'll put a name brand, and they'll charge you more, and we pay more for the name brand. And oftentimes, we do that because of status. That's backwards. It's okay to own things, but we have to be careful that it don't run our lives. Another one that I think is important that's become an idol for us in America is money. Now, when I talk about money being an idol, I'm not just talking about the materialistic things that it can get you. Sometimes we idolize money because we think it can bring us peace, comfort, and security. And sometimes it can do that to an extent. But God said, don't even worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, none of these things, because the Lord knows that you need them. Here's how you can tell if money is an idol for you. Okay? Be wise, put money in savings, have a retirement account, that's okay. But here's how you can tell. I've seen Christians that do that and say, man, I trust Jesus. I don't worry at all because everything's going well. But then the economy starts to go south and you can just see them filled with anxiety. Or their political party will lose. And they're like, oh no, my political party's not in office. The economy's going to fall apart. And oh no, I'm going to lose income. And what that reveals is where was your trust to begin with? Like, it's okay to put money in savings. It's okay to have retirement. But what's your real confidence in? Because those things can go away overnight. They really can. Do you know another thing that we can make an idol? Do you know that you can make an idol out of doctrine and a belief system? You can idolize your belief system. And basically what that is, is holding on to an ideology to the point that actually hinders God's mission. You hold on to the point that it creates pride and you cannot hear opposing viewpoints because you're so narrow-minded in this one area of belief. And this can even be true of things that are true in the Bible. I'll give you an example. It could be like the age of the earth or the rapture theology. I actually have some strong beliefs on those two. Did you know that? But I tell you what, the age of the earth and when God's going to come back is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I can have convictions in those areas but I should not be so beholden. And there are people that are like that. They have disproportionate emphasis on certain doctrines. They care for them. They love them. They're emotionally invested in that doctrine to the point they're like a dog with a bone and they can't let go of it. You ever meet somebody like that? They always go back to that one doctrine. And it's like they've lost sight of the true mission of the gospel. Remember, one of the definitions of idol was a false concept. That happens a lot today in our culture. There are people out there right now that are dying on hills of beliefs that they can't prove, that are speculative at best. And they're dying on these hills, on these mountaintops, to fight and to defend things that they don't know. And then they get angry if you disagree with them. You ever run into one of those persons that you can't even have an adult conversation like they get angry? They've made idolatry out of a belief system. 
because they're emotionally invested and they can't handle it. They spend their life defending it. They're emotionally attached. They make it their focal point rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know that's how cults and false religions are started? It's fixated on one aspect, a variation of a doctrine, and will emphasize one point over the entirety of God's word. Let's start an entire church off of how you baptize. And anybody that disagrees with that is wrong if you're not doing it my way. I don't know about that, but that's not the gospel. Another thing that we can idolize is power or influence. We can start to idolize power or influence. And it's not just the people that are rich and famous. It can happen at a very low level where we're at. Think about Herod. He killed a generation of kids because he feared the birth of a child that was destined to become the king, Jesus. So what he did in Matthew chapter 2 is he killed every child that was two years old or under around Bethlehem and every district around there because he was afraid to lose his authority. Now for you and I, it's more subtle. I don't think we're going to kill a bunch of kids, right? Let's pray. It's none of you guys. But here's what we can do. Here's how power, somebody who idolizes power or influence, it will come on things like they'll have a competitive spirit. And I'm not saying it's, there can be a way that you can compete that's fun, but for them, this competitive spirit is not healthy. They'll have a, a, a spirit of comparison, always comparing their ministry, their life, their job, what they make, their house. It's comparative. They want to hoard power or control. They won't delegate out. The reason why they won't delegate is because they want all the authority. They don't like to share credit with others. They won't allow people to have a seat at the table. And that's something here. Like if you're brand new to our church, you're not going to be on a board because we want to vet you and know your character. But I don't care if you're brand new here. The moment you walk in the door, I want to find a place for you to serve and have a seat at the table. But there are some places where they want to hoard control and power and you'll never have a seat at the table. Another way you can tell is they'll struggle when others succeed. They just struggle to see other people succeed in life. And it makes me think like the disciples in Matthew 20 who argued who's going to be the greatest. Who's going to sit at the left or right hand? And Jesus was like, here you go again. Just like, you don't get it, do you? And he would actually went on to say that if you want to be great, you must be low and humble. And that's what we're called to be. Another one that we have to be careful of, and I want to say this, by the way, when we talk about leadership, good leadership is about influence. God gives us influence to use for his glory. I want to influence people to grow the church, to reach more people. I do want to use that, but here's how you can tell if your influence is a power grab or if your influence is for the glory of God. It's not just what you do, but how you do it and why you do it that matters the most. And that's where we have to be very real before God. God, I might be doing the right thing, but I'm doing the right thing for the right reason. Father, search my heart. Another idol we have to avoid is vanity. Your physique, your body, how you look. That can be an idol. I used to be so obsessed. Um, I know it's hard to tell by looking at me now, but there's a time in my life where like, I was obsessed about how I looked to the point that it consumed me. Like when I was in high school, I had to have everything perfect. I was stressed. I had to have the perfect hair, perfect this, perfect that. But I mean, I get it. You know, I mean, to a degree, I'm going to say this right now, to a degree, all of you have some vanity. To a degree. Um, I wish I was 25 again. I wish I was thinner. I, I miss having hair. Can anybody relate to that? Like that's normal part of being human. Okay. But we have to be careful about letting these things consume us. And I think we live in a culture today where vanity is really a big deal. It just really is. It's over TV. It's just that it makes our kids feel insufficient. In First Peter it says this. Don't let your adornment be outward, ranging of hair, jewelry, and fine apparel. Rather, focus on the heart. Now, here's what I would say. He's not saying you can't have those things. It's okay to have your hair done. In fact, don't come to church looking like a slob and smelling. Okay? I'm glad that you come here and put some deodorant on and, and take a shower, right? But what he's saying is, don't make that the focal point of your life. He said, rather focus on the heart, the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit. I think as Leonard Ravenhill said, could you imagine if we spent as much time praying before church as we did getting ready for church? how much different our lives would be. It's okay to, to, to think about these things, but don't let them control you. And here's why. Um, I don't care, uh, but you're going to get older. It says in, in 
Proverbs 31, that charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a person who fears the Lord will be praised. You're going to get old. You're going to get wrinkly. You might get fatter. Your hair is going to turn color. It's going to thin, fall out. Like, you, you can't stop it. Okay? You just can't do it. It's going to happen. If that's what you put your hope in, you're going to be disappointed. You can't keep up with that. Now, the Bible says it's okay. In fact, it tells you if you fast, even when you fast, you know, comb your hair, look decent. But let's make sure that vanity doesn't drive our life. Now, this next one, it may not upset you guys, but it's going to upset somebody. It may not happen here. It may happen on Facebook. It may happen on YouTube. But I'm going to say it because it's true. It's biblical, and therefore it's loving to say. A major idolatry that's happening in America today is the idolatry of nationalism. Here's what that means. Here's nationalism. It's the identification with one's own nation, support for its interests, especially to the exclusion or detriment of the interests of other nations or people. This is increasingly becoming an issue for American Christians. See, if you study the Jews, what was a major issue that the Jews had in the book of Acts? They could not believe that God would begin to include the Gentiles into the saving faith. They were appalled that these heathens, these unbelievers, that God would include them. They just couldn't handle that. And if we're not careful, we can do the same thing. Did you know that? It's happening today in America. The kingdom of God is not about race, sex, national identity. You know what the kingdom of God is about? It's about Jesus. Jesus and nothing else. That's what it's about. It says right here in Revelation 5, 9 that God has redeemed people from every tribe, every language, every type of people, and every nation. See, America has not cornered the market on Christianity. Did you know that? And we haven't. And if we have, that's really unfortunate because there's a lot of areas where we're dropping the ball. Here's what I would say. If God has blessed America to some capacity, I praise God for it. But if he has blessed us, just like he said he blessed the Jews to be a blessing to the nations, he blessed us for the purpose of blessing others. Not so that we would draw from the world, but that we would be a light to the world and make a difference. And when you get to heaven, you're not going to be divided by your race, your nation, your sex. When you get to heaven, you're not going to come to the gates and he's not going to say, okay, so where are you from? You're from Sweden? Cool. Uh, Swedish people, you're back over here. You're American? Okay, you're over here. Like, you know it's not going to be that way, right? When you get to heaven, we're going to all be together worshiping God. And if we're not careful what we can do, and I see it happening, we begin to exalt ourselves over others. I will say this right now. I love living in America. There's nowhere else I'd rather be. I served my country. I was a patriot. I was a soldier. I was an infantry soldier. And I'm glad that I did it and I do it again. But here's what we have to own. That often patriotism blinds us to the issues that we have in America. Did you know that? We get patriotic to the point that it blinds us. And we can't see our deficiencies. Remember when we went to Iraq because we wanted to get Saddam Hussein because he had a weapons of mass destruction? Do you remember that? Or like he's got weapons of mass destruction so we went there and we didn't find it. But did you know there's only one nation that's ever used a weapon of mass destruction? You know who that is? America. And then we were appalled because we heard that they were torturing our soldiers, which, by the way, is appalling and horrible. But then we did it in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, didn't we? When they did it, it was horrifying, but when we did it, it was for the good of the world. Somebody straps a bomb and they blow themselves up in a marketplace and kill civilian, which, by the way, is, to me is just weak, sick, and disgusting. But we send one of our bombs there and uh, we kill civilians and we say it's just, you know, collateral damage. Do you know back in the 50s that we intentionally infected minorities with venereal disease without their knowledge and many of them died without their knowledge? We did it to test. Did you know that? And all I'm saying is this. I love America, but we have our issues too. We are not perfect. We have sin. There's only one person that's perfect. You know who that is? Jesus Christ. So let's make sure that we don't idolize our nation to the point that we miss out on what it's all about. See, democracy in America is not our savior. I'm actually glad at one of the things, this is another thing that might struggle with people, but that we don't have the flag in here anymore. Oh boy, if I was in Texas, I'd get killed right now, right? So, um, and I love living in America. 
But what we used to do is we'd pledge our allegiance to that flag. And I always thought that was a bit weird because I thought, I believe as an American citizen, you should obey your government. I believe that you should serve your government. I believe that you should honor your government. I love living here. But I'm an ambassador for God, number one. That my allegiance is to God first. My loyalty is to God first and America second. Would you all agree with that? That was actually why the Romans persecuted the disciples. Did you know that? It was actually one of the reasons why the early church was persecuted because the Romans were appalled because they thought that they were confessing their loyalty to God made them traitors, rebels, and disloyal to Herod. But what they're saying is, hey, and you, if you read Paul's writings, Paul said, hey, no, obey the Roman government. Okay, do what they said. Don't be a lawbreaker. Be a law-abiding citizen, but just know that your loyalty is to God. And the Romans hated that. My loyalty, number one, is to God first and to my government second. But I believe you should always obey the government unless, of course, they ask you to do something that's not scriptural. Okay? But I'm here to tell you right now that most of the time what our government asks us to do is not violating the word of God, just to be real. Another thing that can be an idol for people is their church and denomination. Did you know that? You can actually make an idol out of your church and your denomination. It happens all the time. My church is a little bit better than your church. We kind of do it right. You're not doing it so right. Our denomination is getting it right. Your denomination is weird. Like we can do that. Now I will say this. This church here that we will not network with heretical churches and networks. We won't do that. But if it's an issue that's what we call the gray area of scripture, then by all means we're going to partner with other churches. Because here's the thing. I love what we're doing at Renew Church. I love Evangelical Free Network. I really do. I think it's the right choice for us. But I'm not so blind to think that we're doing it perfectly either. Okay? Does anybody think that we could say, man, as a church, we're perfect? Of course we're not. So there have to have some humility to say, hey, as long as it's not heretical, I'm going to love other denominations and I'm going to love other churches as long as they're not crossing some of those heretical lines. Here's another one that people can make idols. The church building. Okay, somebody asked me about this. Why not call it the house of God? Um, so we talked about this last night. The Bible makes it clear that, um, you know where the temple of the Holy Spirit is? You guys. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. See, the building serves the people. The people don't serve the building. Did you know that? And what I love, I love where we've come. I love the sound booth, by the way. I love that we took out that area back there. And I love the changes that were happening. They're just more practical for ministry. But I'm here to tell you that if we'd have tried this three, four years ago, I'd have been crucified. It would have been World War III. But this, because sometimes we can treat the building like it's a museum. It's always been here. Can't touch this. It's just a building meant to serve the people. So I want to ask you this question. When you look at this building, do you want this building to be a museum or a war room? Do you want this building to be a museum or a hospital? See, I want this to be a place where hurting people can come to get healed. I want it to be a place where we're doing spiritual war. I don't want this to be a museum, do you? So we have to be careful because in churches today, um, and it happens all the time. You hear about uh, First Pres in downtown, First Presbyterian, a dying denomination that won't change. They adore their building to the point that they've basically run themselves into the ground and now they have to sell the building because they made the building a place of worship rather than our God. It's another one that's going to rub some people the wrong way, but you know, you know I love you all, right? And I hope this is not you. But we can make idols out of politicians and political parties. That can happen. Which political party is Jesus loyal to? None. He's not loyal to any party. No, I'm going to say this. There are some political parties that do represent godly values. I will say that. There are things that they stand on that definitely align with Scripture, and I say amen to that. But here's the thing. Every single political party and every single politician has deficiencies. Every single political party and every single politician are sinful and have imperfect agendas because we're all sinful and fall short of the glory of God. Does God love Republicans and want them to be saved? Yes, he does. Does God love Democrats and want them to be saved? Because he desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. My hope is not in the right political party and it's not the right politician getting elected. That's why the last, when I first got saved as a Christian, I was that way. Remember when, and by the way, I'm, I like George W. Bush. For all, whatever, say whatever you want, I like the guy. 
Okay, judge me, I don't care. Um, the first time I was a Christian, I stayed up until five in the morning to see if he's going to get elected. Remember that one? And it went on for like a week before they decided. And I was just sweating bullets because God is in this election. And if we don't get the right guy, what's going to happen to America? And I stayed up watching the Electoral College. And in the last couple elections, I go to bed like I normally do. I don't care because I know this, that God is in control no matter who gets elected. Give me an amen on that one, people. Okay, God is in control. So I'm not going to idolize any politician or any party. I'm just not going to. Another thing that we can make an idol out of is security. And when I talk about security, it's going to be savings account, insurance, retirement. Um, it's okay to have those things, but remember where your trust is. Isaiah says this, Woe to you who trust in the world for help, who rely on horses, trusting in chairs because they are many, and in horsemen because they are strong, but don't look to God, nor seek the Lord. In Psalms 94, it says, But the Lord is my defense, my rock, and my refuge. Hey, it's okay to have those sort of things, but you know what? Your security is Jesus. That's it. Here's another one that you can make an idol out of. You can make an idol out of pastors. This happens a lot in American Christianity. We will lift up and exalt a certain pastor, and you shouldn't do that. They dealt with that in 1 Corinthians. Paul said this. He said, I heard there's divisions among you. He said, I want you to be unified and speaking the same thing. He said, but what I'm hearing is one says, well, I follow Paul and I follow Peter and I follow Apollos. He said, did they die for you? And it can happen today where there are people, there are people that I know that used to attend this church that I wasn't their pastor even though they were here because their pastor was somebody in the past or a guy on a podcast they listened to and then all of a sudden they idolize this person and everything that person says is as good as gold. Rather than realizing like, hey, that's a human being, has imperfections, and your standard shouldn't be what one person says. And I would say that even with what I preach, go to the Word of God. The Word of God has to always be your final authority. And when we begin to worship pastors, there's a few things that can happen. One, we become blind. We can begin to tolerate things that we shouldn't in their lives because we can't see their deficiencies. And you know this happens in a lot of churches today in America because when the pastor retires, the senior pastor, you know what almost always happens? A mass exodus of the church. And I wonder, well, why were they there? For God, Christ, or the pastor? And when you do that, by the way, when you idolize a pastor, it's going to lead to unhealthy expectations for the pastor because he's human and you're going to be disappointed. Next one, flow together. You can idolize success and titles. This happened a couple years ago. This is a true story. Um, people were very upset because I wouldn't force people to call me certain titles. I wouldn't, you know, I don't care when kids come here. Like last night, a bunch of kids ran here and they're giving me hugs. I want this to feel like a home to them. Okay? And they're giving me hugs. And there are some people that are mad because I was not reverent enough with the kids. Because I let them hug me and I wouldn't force them to call me Pastor Rob. Okay? I don't care. Because Matthew 23, it was the Pharisees that were all about titles, weren't they? It says the Pharisees do their works to be seen by men. They dress to get attention. I dress to make the average person feel comfortable. That's what I want to do. They dress to get attention. They love the best seats in churches. They love titles to be called by men. But you be different. He goes on to say that you be humble. Another one that we can make an out out of is reputation. Okay? We can begin to idolize our reputation. What people think of us can become an idol. And that's why it says this in Galatians. Do I seek to please men? If I still please men, I'm not a bondservant of Christ. It is tough because I don't like to be disliked. I still, at 50 years old, I struggle with what I think people think of me and what they say about me. But I've had to learn through the years to trash my reputation to serve God and to do what I know he wants me to do and what's his will. So here's what I would say. Are you willing to put what God thinks of you above what others may say about you? Are you willing to do that? We can make an idol out of achievement. Acts 7. They made these wonderful idols, right? And they rejoiced at the works of their hands. And in Acts 12, Herod gave a speech and people started praising him like he was God and God struck him dead because he wouldn't give glory to God. We have to be careful when we don't idolize achievement. We can also idolize comfort. Did you know that? I like to be comfortable. I don't know about you, but I, I like comfort. Uh, the reason why I don't do a lot, of, I love outdoors, but I'm not going to sleep in a tent anymore. <laughs> okay, I'm too old for that. I like to be comfortable. 
In Luke 7, they talked about John the Baptist. said, would you go out to see a man in soft garments? Those who are dressed gorgeously and live in luxury in king's courts. And in James 5, 5, it says, you lived on earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fat in your heart for the judgment. I like to be comfortable, and I think it's okay to be comfortable, but here's what I would say. Don't let comfort rule the course of your life and determine your decisions because sometimes God wants you to be uncomfortable. Did you know that? I'm not saying always, but there'll be time in his life where he's going to want you to be a little uncomfortable for him. You can idolize entertainment and pleasure. It says in the end times, people will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So what I would say for us as Christians, there are some things that God gives you as a pleasure. Go on vacation. Praise God. He might give you things, but I would ask this, is your whole life about going after pleasure? One thing to the next. So ask, what brings you joy truly? I know people that they're always planning my next vacation, my next big purchase, going to the movie, going out, having fun, going to a party, and when that doesn't happen all the time, they feel entitled, they feel angry and cheated, and they don't know how to be happy without that entertainment. If God blesses you some, praise God. But can you find joy and satisfaction in Jesus with all the, without those things? Knowledge can become an idol. In fact, he talks about idolatry. He said, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And I think that's an idol I had in my life here as we wrap this thing up. I used to idolize how much knowledge I had in the Bible. I could study Greek. I could read Greek. I could speak Greek. I memorized books of the Bible. I felt I could win any debate, and I felt like I was pretty righteous. It had become an idol for me, and it was pride. And I had to do a lot of repenting. And I'm still trying to be careful not to fall back into that. Um, you could idolize people. We live in a culture today, it's, uh, we live in what they call a cult of personality culture that exalts stars, politicians, people of fame, that we should idolize them. I saw a thing where Elvis Presley, it was late, girls would go to see Elvis Presley and then they would pass out at his presence. Isn't that weird? They'd cry, oh, and pass out. I'm like, that's weird. We get autographs of people. It's just a signature. We pay insane amount to own things. This is a true story. Remember back in the there was a hockey player named Skeeter Moore for the, the Bulldogs? Um, and so y'all remember that? Well, my Brenda had a friend of hers who loved Skeeter Moore. This is, this is gross and true. Um, so he was leaving the hockey arena one time after a game. He's skating. You know, this is me skating with my hockey stick. Uh, you know, you like that? Um, I'm an actor too. And as he gets off the ice, he spits some gum that he had on the side. She went and grabbed it and put it in a bag and kept it. But we do things like that because we tend to exalt people. You know where the biggest ways that we can see idolatry of people is in codependency? You familiar with that term? Codependency. It's good to be in a relationship. It's a gift from God. But sometimes there are people out there that their self-worth and validation has to be in a relationship and they'll stay in a dysfunctional one if that's what they have to to validate their existence. And yet we're told that even when it comes to your spouse and your boyfriend and girlfriend, that you should love God more than them. Did you know that? It's okay to love that person, to be in a relationship with, with God first. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that's what idols do, is they keep us from loving God with everything that we have. And then the final thing I would say this, and I love this one here. Okay? God says, says we should have nothing to do with idols that we should come out from among them. And if he does that, and if we do that, he said, I will be a father to you and you'll be my children. Anything that takes place in your heart that keeps you from God could be an idol. Here, here's what I would say. I don't want us going home paranoid. Okay? But we probably, if we're honest, have had idols even as we walk with God. Make an honest an evaluation. Know that God loves you and work on it. Right? Okay, God desires your whole worship. And here's the thing. There are things that we hold on to that are idols that we don't want to let go of. But I'm here to tell you that once you let go of it, it's going to be like a weight lifted and you're going to feel so much peace and joy. Okay, because God's got something great for you, but he can't give it to you if your life is filled with idols. Worship team, you can come up here as we close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace. Father, I can't speak for everybody else, but Lord, I want to speak for my own heart. Father, I've had idols. Father, I've had idols even as a pastor. Lord, I want to make an honest examination of my life. Father, I want to rid myself of anything, any idolatry, any idol. Father, anything that might keep me from serving you to the utmost capacity. 
But Father, I thank you that even in those moments, Father, that I have found idols and sins and things outside your will, that you always love us and you're, that, that we can live by grace. Father, continue to work in our hearts and in our minds. Father, we know that the world's going to get worse. More preoccupied with sin, more filled with idols, more things that are going to take them away from you. But Lord, I pray that instead of being discouraged, that we as a church in America would see as an opportunity to shine more brightly and make a difference for your glory. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.